Well, thank you very much. Three very different, but three very important uh, presentations. Secretary uh, Bob Harmetz has to leave at a quarter to two, so uh, with the indulgence of the other two panelists, let me ask him uh, the first question. Uh, Bob, uh, you gave some very cogent analysis, and I think you uh, identified uh, the weaknesses and the uh, uh, that uh, we're facing uh, in the revolution. And uh, you spoke specifically about the kinds of assistance that the United States will be providing and others in the international community will be uh, providing. Uh, it's a lot of money. You mentioned $28 billion that the United States has already provided over the last decades. Uh, I recently read that the IMF totaled it all up and the international community uh, has pledged uh, $75 billion for Egypt and Tunisia, uh, and that uh, 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 the French are pushing that this be delivered quickly. Yet there, uh, had, yet there are still a lot of questions, and, and Ned raised them all, <laughs> beat us up with them all, if, if I might say. Uh, how do you answer Ned's question marks out there? Uh, is assistance alone the answer? And could it be too much, too fast, one of the lessons that perhaps we learned in Afghanistan? Well, uh, thank you very much. First of all, Ned's point uh, is exactly right. No amount of assistance will work unless there are major changes internally in these countries and several others as well. So the, the role of assistance now cannot be as a substitute for what these countries do. It has to be uh, structured in a way that it encourages the kinds of reforms that Ned very uh, cogently spoke of. Um, and, uh, and if these countries don't undertake very fundamental reforms in governance, both political governance and economic governance, uh, and on the economic side, greater transparency, uh, regulations that give uh, companies and younger people opportunity to start companies that support small and medium-sized enterprises, that uh, eliminate corruption and, and cronyism, uh, and, and all the other things uh, he talked about. If those things don't happen, then you can give a lot of money and it won't really do very much at all. In fact, it could be encouraging or supporting the wrong policies or old policies that have proved not to be very effective or to be harmful in some cases. So the, the, he, his use of the quotes by the president, I think, were right on that we have to really look at new ways of doing things and encouraging these countries to look at new ways of doing things themselves. That's difficult to do because there are all, in many of these countries, there tend to be entrenched interests that resist the, that resist the kind of changes that are needed um, to deal with their problems and to give uh, people the opportunity, the hope of greater participation in the political system and greater participation in the economic system and greater inclusivity in, when it comes to, to economic growth. Now, uh, let me just touch on a couple of things that we're doing in this area. Again, they depend on the government um, and the people in the country to succeed or fail, but we can give them opportunities through the kind of assistance we're going to provide. One is uh, the program is by the Overseas Private Investment Corporation to support small and medium-sized enterprises. That can be helpful, but there needs to be a domestic environment regulatory environment that supports those enterprises. Otherwise, it'll be very hard to uh, ensure that this money is used effectively or that these um, enterprises survive. One of the things we found uh, with respect to Eastern and Central Europe, and I was on the Hungarian Enterprise Fund Board and the Russian Enterprise Fund Board, was that companies succeeded or failed in part because of the quality of the leadership of the company, but you need a good regulatory environment, transparency, uh, measures against corruption to create the, the overall uh, business environment for them to succeed. But that's one of the things we're going to do uh, to help that sector of the economy. The second, um, is, and he put his finger on it, and I had, had, had mentioned it, and, um, and Helen had mentioned it, that is education. Um, 
There's a very good report that just came out by the International Finance Corporation called Education for Employment. Well, the problem in many of these countries, let's take Egypt, is there are a lot of universities, uh, and they turn out a lot of students. Um, but in some cases, as this report points out, and as uh, UNDP reports have pointed out, they're, they're not educated to be able to do the kind of jobs that are available or are likely to become available uh, in the Egyptian economy um, now or in the future. So simply turning out educated people, if they're not employed to do something that is going to enable them to be productive participants in the economy, is really not a very effective way of educating kids. Um, so one of the things we're going to be working on is to try to find uh, ways of supporting training programs um, that will turn out people who do have the skills that are required to do the kind of jobs that will be available uh, over the next year, two years, five years, ten years. And, uh, and, and that will be one of the, the, the major areas where we're going to devote our assistance and the money that we're going to be using for um, that, that is generated by these swaps that I talked about, which is the forgiveness of a certain amount of uh, Egyptian debt, uh, debt repayments. And let me just mention one really interesting example of where education drives growth and drives job creation. It's not in the Middle East, it's in South Korea. After the Korean War, the Korean economy, the South Korean economy was a basket case. It had high levels of unemployment. It, 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 it was just destitute. It had a lower GDP per capita than most, most African countries at the time. It was destitute. And what did they invest in? The main thing they invested in was education. And people said, well, you're in USAID. You said, you're crazy. Why are you putting money in education? Because the Koreans knew that if they put money into education, it would generate job creation because they would have a talented pool of people and companies would then build around that, uh, that pool of talented people. So a good educational system that's relevant to the needs of economic growth in the future is critical. It's critical in terms of growth. It's critical in terms of participation. So education is really important, but it has to be the right kind of education. And if it's not, it is not going to succeed, and it has to be coupled with really sound policies on the part of these uh, countries. So the money, the money is important because they do need the money, but more important is the right environment for utilizing the money, and, and also a similar degree of importance is the way we provide it. Is it provided to do things that the Egyptian economy really needs and can benefit inclusive growth? Or is it not? And we have to make sure when we allocate money, particularly in this very tight budget environment, we're accountable to the American people. Institutions like the UNDP are accountable to its members. We have to make sure that we use that money in the most effective way, throwing money at countries we've seen, A, not only doesn't work, but as Ned's very eloquently pointed out, actually can be counterproductive. 